Welcome back to the complete history of World of Warcraft, our series that will chronicle the game's entire development history. Today, we are going down deep into the honor system before exploring the emergent gameplay opportunities that the system created, as well as taking a look at everything else that Patch 1.4 had to offer. Researching these videos takes a very long time. In fact, we actually have an entire new member of staff for this series. So if you'd like to support this content and get World of Warcraft Rise of the Horde for free forever, then hit up today's sponsor, Audible, using my link below. You're watching this video because you care about World of Warcraft history, so I'm almost certain you would love Rise of the Horde, the acclaimed novel that fleshes out Thrall and the Horde. It's a brilliant listen that's just in time for Thrall's return to the game. So sit back as Drakthar tells Thrall about his parents, the old Horde, right through the Draenei's exodus from Argus, through the years of peace, through all of the wars that kicked off the franchise. It's a really good listen. Life's busy, we don't all have time to read, so what better way to pass off your commute than 11 hours of top-notch Warcraft lore? If you're interested, hit up my link below for a free 30-day trial that comes with one book for free. And that's free for life, even if you cancel. Thank you to Audible for supporting the show, and let's get into the video. It's the 19th of April 2005, just a month and a half after patch 1.3, The Ruins of Dire Maul launched. Everyone at this stage is well acquainted with Blizzard's first take on world PvP. Rogues have experimented with minutes long lockouts, the potential of wind fury procs being realized, and mages are settling in comfortably on the top of the pile. PvP was always a foundational aspect of World of Warcraft, but it wasn't until five months in that a substantive reward and progression system was added. Patch 1.4, the Call to War truly was an apt name, as thousands of players were about to pour thousands of hours into the original PvP rank system. <laughs> The honor system of 1.4 was predicated on honorable kills, which you scored by killing a member of the enemy faction within your level range. Not that this concept would protect low-level characters as combat was generally a maelstrom from across the level spectrum. Each honorable kill provided you an amount of honor contribution points, dependent on the rank of your opponent, so that a, say, lieutenant-ranked opponent would give you more honor contribution points than a scout-ranked opponent. Now, when servers went Went down on Wednesday, your contribution points were then calculated and converted into rank points. Now these rank points, they were the essential number for progression, with the total amount of points placing the player in one of the 14 rank brackets, from private slash scout through grand marshal slash high warlord for the alliance and horde respectively. And while that's easy to grasp, the system was not as simple as it may seem at first, as contribution points were based on your honorable kills against the previous week's rank points. It was all quite messy. These rank points would then decay at a rate of 20% of total points per week, with some small allowances being made for players who took time off. This could seem a complicated system, further compounded by there being no specific way to calculate your resultant rank week to week. It was actually quite questionable as to how much of the player base at large actually was aware of how this system worked, but many players did, with it being worked out that your weekly rank adjustment is equal to your rank points earned through honor contribution points minus your rank points decay. So certainly not a simple system. Now interestingly, where the ranks fell was all player driven. This was one of the fundamental reasons why PvP was so enjoyable to so many, but also sometimes quite frustrating and a massive time sink. Rankings were a dynamic system wherein a player's rating was based on the performance of the server's top PvPers, with only the top 0.1% getting Grand Marshal or High Warlord, and the next percentile getting the next three ranks. And this engendered an elite PvP group who were willing to put that time in. PvP always had been a thing, but with this, Blizzard finally provided a tangible payoff. Now, this should all be tempered with reports of players putting in over 100 hours a week 
in order to maintain their PvP standing. A fairly unrealistic expectation for the broader server community, but it's important to note that this was a reward for people who were willing to put in the time. I imagine though that this is a system that Blizzard designed not yet really appreciating the success of World of Warcraft and just how much effort players were willing to put in to get that top 0.1%. The ranks going out to percentages of the player base really did mean that those top ranks, they, they often did just boil down to who could sink in the most time into grinding out those honorable kills. Of course, there was more to rewards than just your rank. The physical representations of these PvP ranks came in the form of the gaudy but much loved PvP sets. At this stage, PvP gear rewards unlocked as you ascended the rank system, but they still would cost gold to acquire. Other very helpful rewards also were there, such as a 10% reduction in all vendor costs, including repairs, once you reached rank 3. Now, with the introduction of unique models for the level 60 epic mounts, a player who was in full PvP gear on their epic mount, that was something to behold. It was proof of player skill and investment, something that appealed to a huge proportion of the player base, but was only achievable by the most dedicated. Really a situation that just brought so much gravitas and prestige to early World of Warcraft PvP. These players were literally some of the most respected people on their server, and this was back in the days before it was easy to reroll a character and level to endgame. So a player's reputation was intimately linked to their main character. In essence, this progression system did not only have gear rewards, but also the intangible benefits of social prestige. As for where all of this PvP action happened, well, Battlegrounds had not yet landed, so players naturally flocked to the cross-faction zones, and as the player base's average level range was increasing, those zones just became bloodbaths, and this was particularly true, of course, for Stranglethorn Vale and the Hillsbrid Foothill with distinct forms of emergent PvP developing in both of those zones. Hundreds of players from both factions would gather in Taran Mill and South Shore, organizing huge PvP raids that ravaged the countryside. With the front lines pushing back and forth, the surge of battle was sometimes messy, confusing, and with a very low frame rate, but it was always quite epic. When one faction prevailed, they would push the enemy back to their town and kill every NPC in sight. Of course, being socially conscious and wanting the battle to continue for more honor kills, emergent gameplay developed out of this as players placed some restrictions on themselves and they would actually pull out of combat back to town to let the enemy regroup and reorganize, being prepared for the next bout. So really, it was just one massive honor kill grinding machine. Then next, Stranglethorn was quite a different experience. The organized combat of Hillsbrid gave way to primitive brutality. Rogues would hide behind every tree in pirate ship, waiting to pounce out on unwary adventurers. If you wanted to get questing done in that zone, it was important to either be in a non-PVP server or to remain incredibly vigilant or to bring some friends with you to quest. The sense of danger, of course, was made so much more real in this patch with the introduction of the Gurubashi Arena event. This happened every three hours when a lone pirate captain wanting to provide some entertainment for his blood sale crew would drop a chest filled with treasure in the arena. Now, this arena was a free-for-all area, so you would actually find yourself just as likely to be in combat with your compatriots as with the enemy faction. Now, the incentive for winning this event was the Grand Master Arena Trinket. Of course, back then in vanilla, a legitimately good trinket, that was a hard-to-come-by thing, and that made this one highly sought after, as it was able to absorb 903 damage. Overall, and a Especially with Stranglethorn and Hillsbrid, players essentially made zones into battlegrounds before Blizzard actually implemented the battleground feature. Of course, that's not all that happened with PvP, as Blizzard paired 1.4's honor system with a number of changes that aimed to improve the PvP experience. For example, diminishing returns were added to Frost Shocks, Frost Nova, and Entangling Roots. Blizzard were actually becoming aware of the differences between PvP and PvE ability design, clearly noticing that crowd control balance in PvP was a major issue for the game, stating this, we've identified this short list of spells as having duration 
operations and cooldowns sufficient to almost permanently slow or immobilize targets, but without adequate controls or other limiting factors. Yeah, you could basically just be CC chained into oblivion. And this really gives us a sense of the chaotic nature of early world PvP, and also how Blizzard found the players use their systems in unexpected ways, and also how their PvE systems weren't perfectly designed for PvP. Of course, this issue of balance and crowd control, while that is something that would plague the World of Warcraft team throughout World of Warcraft's life. Further to this, Druids could now shapeshift out of polymorphs, which was at its core a mechanical change, but importantly is one that reinforced the Druid power fantasy. Then the human racial perception had its effectiveness increased, and hunters could now use the ability Track Hidden. This of course was targeted at rogues who surely were top griefers, so efforts were being made to introduce more counter utility. These changes, of course, could be negated with increased skill, and it drove a finessing of rogue technique. This patch also brought home the grim reality of war with Children's Week, an event centered around the orphans of Azeroth. Oddly enough, though, the grim reality of these children being orphans of our war, well, that didn't really register with much of the player base. Ultimately, patch 1.4 synergized with the emergent gameplay that cropped up since launch, finally rewarding players for their PvP efforts, both in prestige and tangible rewards. That's far from all though, as this patch also had plenty for PvE aficionados, with one of the most compelling aspects of playing a Paladin and Warlock being introduced, the class mounts. For the Paladin, this was a highly thematic questline that tasked them with traveling the length and the breadth of Azeroth, gathering sanctified reagents to carry out their holy task, exercising the lost spirits of Terradale, locating the correct materials to create the barding for their steed, and the mana-enriched horse feed from Dire Maul. They did all of those which then led them to the finale, a climactic battle in the bowels of Skolomans where, after defeating Rattlegore, the paladin and their party must survive four increasingly difficult waves of spirits, culminating in a clash with one of their diametrically opposed archetype, the Death Knight Dark Reaver. And once this Death Knight was slain, it was up to the paladin to take the fallen charger mount and cleanse it, freeing the beast from an existence of undead servitude. Of course, not to be thematically outdone, the Warlocks had a decidedly dastardly set of quests to complete to gain their mount. This began with finding Morzul Bloodbringer at the Altar of Storms. They then had to go about getting ritual items, including the Bells of Death Mora, the Doomsday Candle, and the Wheel of the Black March. Once gathered, they would then seek out Lord Bane Hollow in Felwood. And this is an incredible section of the questline where the Warlock would have to disguise themselves as one of the cultists in the Shadowhold just to interact with Bane Hollow. They were then then sent out to kill one of the cult's traitors, whose heart would be an essential part of the warlock's ritual magic. The warlock then had to gather up a party and venture into Dire Maul, where they would use the items acquired earlier to open a demon gate to the burning legion world of Zoroth. The party then had to summon forth the legion's stable master and defeat him for the right to claim the finest steed in all of the great dark beyond, a very fitting and otherworldly questline for the warlocks. While in some ways these weren't as much of a challenge to achieve as your level 40 mount from just the raw gold perspective, it's not quite correct to say that these were a free level 60 epic mount because it would also require a significant investment in time and gold to get all of these items, get the group going, and actually get it. But once you got that mount, it was an incredible feeling of self-worth. The struggle was real to get them, and the payoff was a real highlight for warlocks and paladins. Of course, that's not all the Blizzard added, as hunters also got their epic class quest. Yes, the one that gave you the renowned Rock Delar. Rather than making a big song and dance over it, though, Blizzard just left the questline to be discovered in the world, something that no doubt contributed to its lasting intrigue and also reinforced the adventurous nature of early World of Warcraft. Of course, there were some other things. Mages can now loot the Tome of Arcane Brilliance, much like the previously introduced spells for the Druids and the Priests. This would be a group-wide buff to intelligence, which was very useful, but also like those past Druid and Priest tomes from our previous episodes, well, they would take a little bit of dedication to actually get. The Tome of Arcane Brilliance was a random drop, but its highest chance was from Lord Kazakh, so getting this was quite an effort. 
1.4's PvE content was not only class limited though. Azeroth was beset with elemental invasions as of this patch, with endgame zones becoming more effectively fleshed out. Again, the sense of wonder was stoked here, as the only official notice of this event prior to its implementation read, concerned adventurers should investigate Silithus, Ungoro Crater, Ashara, and Winter Spring to counter these incursions. And this really left much of it up to personal player exploration, placing the initiative squarely in their hands, certainly a strong move. Now, each invasion would start when the titanic portals to the elemental plane would appear and rip holes in the fabric of reality from which elementals would spill forth. Now, as players fought to stem this tide, elemental leaders such as Baron Char would spawn in and shout challenges to everyone in the zone. And this would continue until a band of adventurers slew the elemental leaders, making the zone safe once more. These invasions would also later be an essential stopping off point for players seeking to complete their Dark Moon Fair elemental decks, with each of the four elemental leaders having between a 5 and 9% chance of dropping the Ace of Elements. Patch 1.4 also brought with it a raft of quality of life changes. Characters who died as a consequence of mind control would no longer receive durability damage, which honestly didn't change the cruel dynamic of Priest gameplay that much. One of the more controversial changes to happen in this patch was also the reworking of the Succubus model to be a little bit less revealing. Now, along with these changes was also a sizable list of environmental changes that in some ways highlighted the evolving nature of the game, but also, well, some of its issues, with prominent good things being being the remodeling of Anderhall, but also largely a lot of these changes being in order to prevent flight points from taking you through trees or hills, or maybe cleaning up some of their mistakes, like the tree that was floating above the Defias Tower in Westfall. This list included 43 other such minor fixes, along with 23 further bug fixes. Players at the time could really just see the world developing, with a lot of these apparent mistakes being pointed out by the player base themselves. So there you go, patch 1.4 call to war. It's not really like players needed a call to war, they were perfectly fine killing themselves anyway, but of course this really stoked the fires of PvP, now giving players something in return for their efforts. Of course though, this was vanilla World of Warcraft, it was always changing, and in patch 1.5, our next episode, we are going to see what Blizzard had in store for players with Battlegrounds, including the legendary first incarnation of Alteric Valley. So thank you very much for watching this video. We absolutely love putting these together. And um, yeah, our next episode is going to be so much fun going through Alteric. And if you'd like to check out our first three episodes, then you can just check out the playlist. So thank you very much for watching. If you'd like to support us, just spread this around. You can discuss it in our Discord. Whatever you want to do, we appreciate it a lot. Thank you very much for watching. And with that, I'll see you next time. Thank you.